Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, welcome your host. لا بعد 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 انفخ أكثر. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, mothers and lovers, welcome your host. لا بعد بعد لا لازم تنفخ ما جاي يضحكون بعدهم بعد بعد. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, mothers and lovers, Iraqis and non-Iraqis, welcome your host. لا بعد بعد لازم بعد أكثر. أكثر من أم الكائنات الفضائية إيه يلا بعد مهم مخلوقات الخطية Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, mothers and lovers, Iraqis and non-Iraqis, ghosts and aliens لك فشلتنا ولك يلا بعد Please get your hands ready nice and warm for your host the amazing the incredible لكشن السوبرمان هو فضها بعد فضها the amazing قول قول مبدع قول مبدع يلا the host the amazing the incredible the inventor ولك مو المخترع المبدع فشلتنا طاح حظك please welcome your host the amazing the incredible the مبدع the super talented he's come all the way from Melbourne it took him 45 minutes from his home in Melbourne to get to the airport it took him one hour by plane from Melbourne to Sydney airport and then he made the mistake of catching the train from Central to Kazula and it took him three and a half days but he's here now so put your hands together for the super talented acclaimed actor writer comedian and million other things Osama Sami no please 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 no please please bad 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 no please Please, please, please. So how we're going to edit that is I'm going to say no, please, and then you cut to them just applauding more and more. Welcome, everybody. Um, now, I've got to say, that really satisfied my ego. That was amazing. If you ever need an ego boost, this is what you try. You come in, people are applauding for you. And uh, yes, first thing, switch your phones off, please. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, what, what we need is, uh, I've got to say though, I'm a fragile artist and uh, that's not good enough for my ego. Now, we need an applause that's good enough for this crowd. Come on! Hands together! Yes! Now, this is the Iraqi Cultural Festival, obviously, but it's happening in Australia. Now, why I did this bit about the ego and playing against the humility, against being humble, is that uh, it's similar in Australian culture. You know, we've got what's called the tall poppy syndrome, if you're aware. So you can't really talk up your achievements here in Australia. If you're a award, I mean, the more you achieve, the less they want to know about it, basically. I'll tell you a little conversation that happened with uh, a, a, fr a few friends at a barbecue the other day. I went over and I was new and, and I'm being introduced. And I was one of the guests there and I go over and they're like, Oh, yeah, get I mate, how's it going? I'm like, yeah, I'm very well, thanks. And the way I think I sound when I'm around Australians is like this. I think I sound like this compared to their accent. And I said, uh, I said, uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, what's your name? I said, oh, yeah, Osama. Um, yes, yeah. so I was like, oh, yeah, like Osama bin Laden. <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, mate, this Osama ain't bin Laden a year and three months. <laughs> this is an 18 plus joke for the kids out there. And, uh, and he said, oh, yeah, what do you do for a Bob, mate? What do you do for a living? I said, uh, I'm, I'm an actor, performer comedian, filmmaker. He's like, oh yeah, good on you, Cobba. Well done, mate. That's the way to go. That's the Aussie spirit. I'm like, oh yeah, he, you know, he wants to know more. I said, yeah. He's like, what, what, what have I seen you in? I said, um, well, I've been, I did a film last year called Ali's Wedding. Ali's Wedding, everybody. <laughs> All right, 12 people have seen it here. That's good to know. And uh, I said, yeah, Ali's Wedding. He's like, oh yeah, that's the way, mate. Good on you, buddy. I said, yeah, and um, we're on Netflix worldwide right now. I was like, oh, settle down, mate. Take it easy. This is the way it is. Straight away, you have to. And Iraqis are the same. We're the same in a way that the more we achieve, 
we don't really want that achievement to be attributed back to us. For example, we've got our guest here, Doctor. And now, I was told to get the names right. Because last year, apparently, somebody got some names wrong. And the person who told me to get the names right is the festival uh, director, uh, Wathak Naji. Uh, Faras Naji. <laughs> And uh, of course, we have with, with us the wonderful surgeon himself, the rock star of surgeons, uh, Majid Al Mohandas, everybody. <laughs> Munjid Al Mudarras, obviously. Um, now, very excited. Now, uh, playing on the humbleness. Now, you asked the doctor, and we've got Dr. Ahmed here as well, and they're all laughing, guys. The doctors are laughing more than you. This is unbelievable, unheard of. And, uh, and, and they would say, like, they would go, oh, doctor, doctor, you just saved that person's life. And the surgeons would be, uh, they reckon, uh, no, this is uh, all God Almighty. Uh, he, it is all up to him, really. But no, doctor, you applied all your studies and your experience and you saved that person's life. No, but God Almighty, he... Gives and, and he, it's really him. And I've got another friend, Haider, I don't know if you know, he's, he's in the Australian uh, Taekwondo team and he wins medals in the Olympics. And I said, dude, you win an, an Olympic medal, that's a big achievement. It's like, oh no, that's my parents' jeans. And I don't know why I pointed at my pants, I don't mean these jeans, obviously. I'm just a bit hyper from all the tea. And, uh, and, you know, I said, yeah, I, th I think, I think that uh, we don't want any accountability or be culpable culpability if it turns out things go sour. If things go wrong, we don't want it to come back to us if we don't achieve something. So, uh, doctor, doctor, the patient is dead. Uh, well, God almighty... Uh, <laughs> He uh, gives and takes away. No, but doctor, you gave him a lethal injection of morphine. It was you, man. It was you. No, but God Almighty is the one who... Uh, I mean, the, the thing about us, you know, not the, the whole... Um, the irony is, with Iraqis, the less you achieve, the more you brag. The more you gloat. Like this guy. Hey, Ani Abu Saleh Al Musalleh. They don't call me Abu Saleh Al Musalleh for no reason. Huck, yalla, I fixed it for you. She know what did what? Hi, Sara, chuf. Rahamut like a stone, they say shut off me. That's an irrigation slash sanitation joke. A shit joke, basically. So uh, that, that's what it is. So the less we, in fact, Iraqis, we have like this big slogan for something we have no part of. We think we invented football, soccer. <laughs> See, they're singing it. No, it wasn't Iraqis, it was the English. Speaking of the colonizers, uh, yes, al um, We're here on indigenous land. So, obviously, one of the first things that you come out and you acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, but uh, I've, I've been to a lot of events recently and it feels like just something we say and an and obligation to fulfill. But really, uh, I'd like on behalf of the festival to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the custodians, their elders, past, present, into the future because uh, we're on land of uh, dance, song and story and storytelling has been told on this land for thousands of years if not tens of thousands of years if you trace back or all the paintings that they're finding all over Australia in, in, uh, in the remote communities. So, uh, and, and I think for us we have, uh, you know, we were uh, colonized by the British as Iraqis and Australia uh, has uh, the same fate basically and, and uh, we, we have to acknowledge that we are, you know, we benefit 
uh, from uh, this land, who uh, is owned by the first people, the first nations people. Uh, so, but um, also speaking of respect, before I hand over to uh, Wathak Naji, uh, is uh, <laughs> his wife there is like. Should I air the fighting that was happening here before? No, <laughs> we um, I'll tell that joke later. Now, uh, the, the respect, the good thing is, we're, we're kind of, this is a good thing. Like, Iraqis have a good sense of humor. Aussies, fantastic sense of humor, real laid back. You can uh, almost have a go at anyone, and, and, and it's kind of okay, you know. Um, uh, for example, like, you know, we have uh, Dr. Ahmed Rubai. He was here before. I, he drove me in. We were in the car. And I told him, you're looking great, Dr. This is uh, three years in a row and you're looking better and better. And he said, yeah, but I'm getting more gray hairs each time you see me. So, you know, just a bit of sense of humor. Now, uh, this is a true story that happened to my sister recently. The, I don't know, for, you, for those of you who practice, uh, the Arba'inia was on. And uh, she went to Karbala to perform the ritual. Now, she's saying she's in the minibus. And they're driving with all the... They're not Mashaya because they're in the minibus. Um, so with the Raidarie, the people who are riding. And uh, they're going to uh, visit uh, the pay respects to Imam Hussein's shrine. And she says, on the way, um, what happens is this little car, this regge, which you're familiar with, yeah, yeah, Volkswagen little shitty car, Hitler's car, basically comes in and smashes into the minibus. And now, no fault of the bus drivers, the car just veers through at this giant roundabout, she said. And, and, the, and the bus driver, he comes down and he looks, and then he realizes that the driver of the Volkswagen is a Sayyid. And the Sayyid is really like, he's almost in tears. This is true, I'm not, ha this, is, uh, this is a true story. And he's saying, oh no, I don't have insurance. What's gonna happen to me? And his insurance was Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, basically, on his car. I swear, on his car, it says, Ta'meen Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. <laughs> Insured by Imam al-Abbas. <laughs> but, <laughs> But here's the kicker, is that the respect thing that we've got, and this is what I love about us, that sometimes it goes too far, but here the bus driver said, La Sayyidna Saduk Shadib, no way I'm going to make you pay for this damage. La, you are Sayyid, you are Ibn Rasulullah, what would Imam Abbas do to me? He gets back in the bus and drives off. So this is where respect gets you kids, basically. You can smash people's cars, is the moral of that story. Now. So I'm going to invite, uh, well, uh, talking of respect, got a, a welcome uh, for us. We'll welcome everybody uh, again officially, but I'd like to welcome all of you here, as well as our dignitaries now. Uh, where is our councillor, Nathan Haggerty? There, there he is, young fella over there at the front. Uh, good to have you here in the absence of Mayor Wendy Waller. Now, uh, the mayor was unfortunately unable to be with us. I'm thinking of making my next uh, film is going to be, uh, you know, Ali's Wedding was a romantic comedy. I'm going to make a mystery. The mystery on why politicians disappear whenever there's a cultural event. <laughs> and, um, but it's, it's great to have you with us, Nathan, and uh, Dr. Uh, Munjid as well. We're going to hear from him later on. We've got wonderful music uh, for you guys by a couple of sisters who've been performing worldwide and uh, they're, they're on the uh, wind instrument and th that's going to be great as well. So uh, without further ado, please. Now I want this clap to be ten times the one that it was for yours truly, for Faraz Naji. No, please stop, please stop. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's a very light note. Uh, we would like to, you know, uh, break the ice. Thank you, Osama. Appreciate it. We all uh, got Your some... welcome. Oh, come on, have it. <laughs> Sometimes he goes too far. <coughs> Uh, I'll first speak in Arabic. 
نرحب بكم في افتتاح مهرجان شناشيل الثقافي العراقي لعام 2018 ونتمنى لكم اوقاتا سعيده عندنا برنامج حافل يتضمن عروض فنيه وفولكلوريه عروض الافلام القصيره واخيرا مسك الختام مع حفل شناشيل الموسيقي يسرني اقدم تحيه خاصه الى ضيف المهرجان دكتور منجد المدرس and uh, welcome everyone to this year's Shana Shields uh, Iraqi Cultural Festival. I'm I am delighted to share with you uh, a taste of Iraqi culture. Every year I try to make it a bit different and we add some more flavor to it. I also would like to extend uh, a warm welcome to our guest, special guest, Dr. Munjid Al Mudarris. And uh, this year, while it was financially challenging, but we expanded our uh, festival. We had over 100 people participating, participants in this festival today. We have four sessions, so that's a, a good achievement. And we also are, uh, we have some uh, non-Iraqis and participants, but also in the audience. So we're keeping true to our objectives. The festival ob objectives is to bring Iraqis from different diverse groups together, which is important to us. We would like to engage with the Australian community, and also we would like to present our best art and culture. So finally, I would like to thank our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be gathering here to celebrate Iraqi culture. <coughs> Firstly, Liverpool, Liverpool City Council for the corporate sponsorship. And I would like to give special can, uh, thanks to Councillor Nathan Haggerty. He, he, he was really for his dedication in helping us. And also I would like to thank uh, Powerhouse Art Center for, being, for partnering with us. Uh, Settlement Services International, SSI, for sponsoring the festival, uh, the folklore, <coughs> sorry, the Folklorama program, which will be downstairs as we get down. And also to Core Community Services for spon sponsoring the uh, community visual art mural that you will see at the stage downstairs. So we have uh, uh, grants for specific projects. Also would like to uh, uh, thank our other sponsors who we value their ongoing help and commitment. Uh, Starts, Western Sydney MRC, Parents Cafe and Panorama Arabic Newspaper. So thank you and hope you enjoy the program today. <clears throat> Keep it going, keep it going for Faraz, Naji, everybody. Wow, very brief, very sharp, the way we like it. Now, uh, our next guest, uh, as Faraz mentioned, is going to be the councillor from the Liverpool City Council, Mr. Nathan Haggerty. If you would please uh, put your hands together for our esteemed guest, everybody. Thank you. Um, I'd also, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet. Um, uh, spoke, the BMC spoke uh, very heartfelt and very, um, it was very good the way he, he spoke about acknowledging the uh, traditional custodians of the land. Um, in particular, this is the, um, the land of the Cabrigal clan of the Darug Nation. Um, and just outside you've got the, uh, the Georges River, which was a very important um, food source and uh, gathering place for the local indigenous population. Uh, can I start by acknowledging um, some dignitaries? I believe up the back there, there are a couple of councillors. Is that you, Jeff? That's Jeff. So, Councillor Jeff Shelton and I believe Councillor Chris Caliana, there's a wave, uh, have snuck in at the back. Um, and we also have uh, Ali Mohammed Bakar Witwit, the consul um, from, the, uh, from the Republic of Iraq. Thank you for coming today. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the wonderful Kasula Powerhouse Arts Centre, Liverpool's premier arts and cultural institution. Our mayor, who has gone missing, <laughs> there you go. Um, likes to call this place our town hall. Um, testament to that, um, I've spent a considerable amount of time here in the last three days. Uh, we've got today's festival, we had a, an arts launch and I was uh, here for lunch on, um, on Friday. So. Uh, for those of you that know Craig who runs this place, I'm a little worried he, uh, he might start charging me rent. Um, so uh, we'll see how we go. <laughs> um, 
For those that, that don't, oh, you, do, you do know who I am, I was just introduced. But um, I'm a councillor at Liverpool City Council and I'm here representing the Mayor. The Iraqi Cultural Festival has been part of our city since 2013 and it is a wonderful celebration of culture and the arts from the many and diverse cultural groups of Iraq. More than 9,800 Iraqi-born residents reside in our city of Liverpool and more than 23,000 people speak Arabic at home. That makes it our second most uh, spoken language. So obviously English being the first and then second is Arabic. So uh, there is a, a significant um, input there. Our city is proudly diverse, multicultural and harmonious. In that regard, uh, Liverpool is a lot like the Iraqi Australian Univer University Graduates Forum, uh, the organisers of today's festival. The members of the forum come from a diverse cross-section of Iraqis, many religions, denominations and cultures. And every year they do an amazing job putting this festival together. Uh, don't you think they do a, a great job? Yes, give them a round of applause. Uh, we have a, they have a packed program ahead uh, in the first session. Dr. Al Medeiros, is that, uh, yeah? Pass? B plus, B minus. Yeah, okay. Uh, he's one of Australia's top orthopaedic surgeons and he will speak about his latest visit to Iraq, uh, helping amputee war victims walk again using robotic implants. Uh, the doctor is a remarkable Iraqi Australian with an extraordinary personal story of seeking asylum uh, to come to this country by boat. Uh, while certainly a remarkable story, uh, thankfully the doctor's story is not rare. There are many Iraqis and many people who have sought asylum that have gone on to make an amazing contribution to this country. Those people are not just a testament to themselves, their families and their communities, but they're also a testament to the great work uh, both the country and our local support services provide. Australia, and in particular Western Sydney, is world's best practice when it comes to these kinds of programs and services. Uh, and I'm happy to see that we have a number of those organisations sponsoring today's event. Now, uh, in the interest of uh, transparency, I will say that uh, I'm on the board of one of those organisations. Um, I'm a, a director at Western Sydney MRC and it's great to have our CEO, Kamal, here today. Um, and as both a director of Western Sydney MRC and a councillor, uh, I'm very lucky and privileged to attend a, a whole bunch of uh, celebrations and festivals like this, uh, despite the earlier jokes. Some of us do, attend, uh, do like attending cultural festivals. <laughs> uh, festivals and events like this provide a valuable opportunity for the host communities to pass on important cultural knowledge to the next generation. Uh, and I can see a couple of young kids here today, which is great. Uh, for the rest of us uh, in the Liverpool community, it's a fantastic opportunity to enjoy some music, art, culture, food uh, and of course people uh, from around the world, uh, all here in Liverpool, all in our backyard. We've got a great day ahead. Uh, we've got some art, some film and some music to enjoy. Thank you to all the artists and entertainers who have uh, part of the festival. Thank you for contributing to our city's vibrant and diverse arts and culture scene. To the festival goers, I encourage you to share your experience on social media uh, so the rest of Sydney can see uh, all the great stuff they're missing out on today and hopefully will come next year. Have a fantastic day. Thank you. Yes, keep it going. Yeah, keep it going for Nathan. Thank you. Yes. That's the rock star. That's the future mayor right there. So uh, if you want uh, sort of any, you know, you've got dodgy permits that need fixing, here's your man. <laughs> yeah, he's saying no, which is a yes, of course. Uh, as we know, you're not getting away, mate. And then there's a couple of councillors hitting at the head and up at the back. So you guys could be part of my series if you're interested in acting the missing mayor. That's the mystery. We can, uh, we can sort that out. And of course, um, look, uh, you know, this is just such a great day. It's one of those days that you, you feel in like yeah, every day we go about our daily business and, and then, you know, we eat three times a day or five times a day if you're me. But the thing is, we, how often do we feed and nourish our souls? And I really believe when Faraz was uh, so gracious enough to ask me to host again, uh, this, you know, my third year here, and each year I, I come in and, and I consume 
uh, what there is, uh, not just in this uh, building here, but it is, it is a remarkable building and it's got a great history as well, like you talked about the river as well. And, uh, there, and then after with the music and everything, and I feel a, going away feeling just really amazing. Now, I am a bit hyper and excited because I've consumed something else. Look, look, the few people who love, they think drugs. No, yeah, especially Nathan is like, oh yeah, he's on the Charlie. No, no, that, I'm actually just high. You know what our drug of choice is as Iraqis? Chai, thank you, tea. Yes, 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 we have morning tea. The English think they have tea. No, we have tea. Come to our houses. And that's why people have so much tea. You go to an Iraqi person's house, it's like, Labal Khel, 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 And we're always just so high and excited, just tea, morning tea. And then there's the tea after morning tea. And then there's the tea after the after morning tea. And then there's the mid morning tea. And then there's the tea that after the mid morning tea. And then there's the afternoon tea. And there's the tea after the afternoon tea. Tea and there's the evening tea and there's the tea after the evening tea and we're just having tea all the time in fact I'll give you a little um, just to for, for the uh, my uh, the friends who are non Iraqis I'll give you an idea how much we consume tea is that in government buildings and in companies and offices and the consuls here the Iraqi consul welcome and in his office and in every office in Iraq we have a person whose job description is Chai Chi. <laughs> chai Chi, the person who just serves you tea. That's an actual job. <laughs> we love tea so much. We have a whole song about it. <laughs> See? We love tea. Don't give us tea, man. And, and, before I introduce Dr. Ahmed, whilst I've got you all here, coffee, the Iraqi coffee, you know that little shot coffee that's the size of an ant? But it's lethal, it's like the, the one that the surgeon gave to kill the patient, he gave him probably a lot of coffee, I think that's what it was. That coffee, and I don't know, some of you might know this, some of you might follow this tradition, and for those of you who don't know, you're, let's, let's say you're going and you're sitting down in, a, in, a, in an event, and the person who's bringing you the, the coffee comes, comes over and he pours you the coffee. And what do you have to do when you hand it back? Does anyone know? Yes. You have to shake your hand to say you've had enough. If you don't, what happens? They keep filling in more coffee. The, the atom size is like, that's why it's a nuclear bomb, that coffee. I'm telling you, inside your body. So they go more. So I didn't know this. I've come in, I grew up in Coburg, in Melbourne. And, which is kind of the Liverpool equivalent, probably, I think. So I've grown up and I've gone this to the guy. And he went, Whoosh. I'm like, oh, that's a strong motherfucking tea. And yeah, he is, he is, he is. We're not, we're not adults here. And then <sighs> I'm like, thank you very much. No, you can't say thank you. You have to do this thing. And then I, I'm like playing the recalcitrant, you know, the renegade, the rebel. I'm saying, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to break tradition. No, thank you. And he goes, <sighs> I'm like the third one. <sighs> Now my hands are shaking by default. <laughs> now my hands are really just shaking. I'm like, that's where it came from. That's why most of our dancers, if you see, that's where it comes from. How are you going there, darling? Translating. Uh, <laughs> The sonde and the the khadri chai khadri. So I'd like to invite my next guest. Who? Yes, you do have a little bit of grey hair, but ayaratni bishay bahu wakaru. So I'd like to invite the president of the Iraqi gradu University Graduate Forum, Dr. Ahmed Rabai. Thank you very much. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owner of the land we have the event on today and pay respect to their elders. 
past, present, and emerging. Mr. Ali Witwit, acting Iraqi counselor in Sydney, Councillor Nathan Haggerty, representative of Liverpool Mayo, Ms. Wendy Weller. Mr. Kamal Dabusi, CEO of Western Sydney Migrant Resource Center. Mr. Dr. Imad Mutashar, board member of uh, Western Sydney Migrant Resource Center. Mr. Brian Troy, ex councillor Botany Bay Council. Uh, friend councillors available, I don't have their names. Um, and our uh, special welcome to our guest, distinguished surgeon, our colleague, Dr. Munjid Al Muderis. Welcome to our 2018 version of Iraqi festival, uh, cultural festival, Shinashil, our major annual station to celebrate diversity in culture and creation and highlight Iraqi talent in art, music, and design. Year after year, the festival is proving its unique role in bringing together all components of Iraqi community from all religions, Christian, Muslims, Mandayan, Aizadis, and from all ethnicities, Arab, Kurd, and Turkmen, reflecting the beautiful mosaic of Iraqi society throughout history. We are proud that this festival has shown again that it is not only the biggest event for our Iraqi and Arabic community, but also the only event which works as a platform for all sects and groups. Throughout the years, the festival and its activities were designed to promote harmony and social inclusion of all Australians from Iraqi descent, with a special focus on new arrivals, youth, women, and people with disability, particularly in West Sydney, this rapidly growing area which hosts the largest number of new arrivals. The festival is designed also to present and promote the real face of Iraqi society and its rich culture and heritage with the deep-rooted tolerance and harmony. That face was unfortunately replaced or displaced by all the features of wars, dictatorships, and extreme violation of human rights throughout four decades of Ba'ath policy state and by all features of sectarianism, social and cultural regression, corruption and violation of human rights which dominated the last 15 years of Iraq recent history. I would like to conclude by acknowledging the great and tireless efforts of an army of volunteers in Shana Shiel team and university graduate forum, and in particular, our colleague Firas Naji, the festival director, and Dr. Bushra al obaidi the president of our forum over the last two years with great efforts in having this festival supported, promoted, and uh, covered financially and by grants. In addition to also all members of Shinashir team, May Jamil, Layla Naji, Samira Ali, Sana Al Ahmar, Tanya Muhammad, Kaukab Makki, Zahra Mahdi, Hassan Ali, Hussam Shkara, Jalil Duman, and other volunteers, Nahla Al Baqal, Rafid Shakir, Eli Aboud, and Salam Naim. We extend our thanks also to all festival sponsors. May I take this opportunity to congratulate our colleague, distinguished artist, Haider Ebadi, the winner of the overall winner prize in the 21st Liverpool Art Society annual exhibition held uh, yesterday here. 
for his work intimacy. You can you can you can have it there in the in the exhibition show. And I just would like to quote the the judge's comment. And that is an example of the talents we have in our community. The judge comments that this is a complex work that delivers a profound and universal theme, highly excited and visceral. I wish you a great day today. Thanks. Yeah. You know what I'm going to say, so just do it. Yes. 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 The Bombers take another goal. Uh, the Bombers are a football team. Um, yeah, I'll let that percolate a little bit. Osama is saying, come on, Bombers. Uh, one person, knows, oh, it's, it's a Sydney. You know, you know, don't get AFL football here. But who, which team? Mr. Heckler? Rabbitohs? They're not an AFL team, sir. Um, yeah, it's, it's good that we've got a couple of whiteys in the house that can appreciate a Bombers joke. Um, now, uh, Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for that. And it, again, it shows us the talent and the, the pool of uh, you know, what we've got here. And, and it's great to see one of our fellow Iraqi brothers, Haider, win such a prestigious award. And look, we, we're all excited uh, to listen to uh, Dr. Munjid. I've actually had the pleasure of listening to him deliver a keynote last year at a, a refugee event. So that's going to be uh, really worth listening to. Um, but first, we have a couple of musicians who grew up in uh, Orange in New South Wales. Yeah, I had to do that. It just lent itself. And five people got it. So that's good. It's just a song about the orange. That's, he's translating to the councillor. It is a song about orange. Uh, it doesn't... <laughs> It's like, I know, I know, man, I'm just teasing. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to say, Khadri Chai Khadri. Uh, steep the tea, steep the tea. <laughs> it just doesn't translate. Some things just don't translate. But what will translate is music. Now, music is so universal. It's one of those things that obviously, like the power of story, transcends uh, uh, you know, our faith and, and, and d denomination and our skin color and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so these uh, lovely girls, from they grew up in Orange. They've performed everywhere so it's going to be an absolute treat for us to listen to them on the clarinet and the flute and they've performed in Italy and, and Norway and, and here as well and, and part of the uh, Sydney Symphony Orchestra as well so it's just wonderful to have this uh, duet uh, with us please make a lot of noise for Sarah and Sandra Ismail <laughs> yes let's go quickly
Yes, please. Uh, see, surprise you there. Keep it going for Sandra and Sarah Ismail. It, uh, now, I know which one is uh, Sarah and which one Sandra, but it, it did take me a while to figure out because I just, you know, came in uh, and, and that's why I asked who the councillor was. And um, I, it reminds me of a, a little event that, little event, little uh, story that happened to me at the airport. I've been travelling a lot, you know, for my film's been at festivals all over the world. But this happened to me where in Iran, in an airport in Iran, Again, I'm not making any bit up. Yeah, I might be you know, exaggerating the performance, but this happened bit by bit. So what happened was, uh, you know, Iran speak, they speak Farsi, Persian, uh, and uh, their Arabic is quite rusty to say the least. So there was this guy and, and in front of me, and he's uh, uh, about to check in, but he's got excess luggage. And he's with his four wives because he's from Saudi Arabia. I swear to Imam Abbas this is true. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, right? And uh, the, the, the Imam Abbas thing, a little side sidetrack, but I had an Iraqi friend who was dating this Aussie girl for a while, and then she said, look, um, I, we've got to break it off because there seems to be a lot of cultural differences. He says, Wallahu da'at al-Abbas, there is no cultural difference. <laughs> She's like, that's exactly it. You're saying Abbas, there's no control difference. But anyway, so what's happening is that this guy from Saudi Arabia, who I can understand because I can speak Arabic, is really exacerbated and he's re really angry basically by the fact that uh, his wives have went and, and their luggage is, is so much that their excess luggage is 500 kilos. 500 kilos! And so he's standing there, and I'll do it in English, uh, but he was saying it in Arabic to his wives. And, and he's like, what have you done to me? Wilchen, what is going on? You went and bought all of Tahran? All, what have you bought? A fridge, a TV? We have it in Saudi Arabia. Wallah al -Azim. What did I do? Why did I get married to you? And in particular, he was targeting one of his wives, who I think was the culprit there. She, I think she'd went and bought the TV. She, I think they'd bought a fridge or something. <laughs> I swear. It was this, I mean, you've seen at airports, if you're at Beijing, there's you know, people buying TVs nonstop. So this was the fridge version. And she's sitting there with her niqab, you know, the, the burqa, and, and uh, just casually having a slurpee underneath it. You know, like she doesn't care. She doesn't care. It's his problem. And he's like, you... I should have never married you! Why did I marry you? You went and bought Tahran, 500 kilos of manageable flutes! Where am I gonna get the money? Why have you done this to me? And this is what she does. She goes, and he goes, what you? You! True story. So, <laughs> and I could understand the Iranians could not. They're just seeing a, a Saudi Arabian guy yelling at his wife, you know. Um, now, uh, what, who we can distinguish is our next guest. The rock stars, I said, of orthopedic surgeons. Now, I found a little tidbit about uh, this fine young man. And uh, he is, in fact, uh, not only an ambassador for the Australian Red Cross, but part of the uh, Australian uh, uh, Air Force uh, squadron, part of the Australian Air Force. And then the next sentence said, he helps war victims. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance much? <laughs> I had a look, I'm um, like, okay, so he's part of the Air Force that dropped bombs and then he helps the <laughs> amputees. No, I'm, uh, this guy, my brother's in the Australian Army and very proud of it. So, uh, just without fur further ado, I, I, I will uh, present you with uh, Ziad Obaidi, member of the Australian University Graduate Forum, to take over and you're in for a treat. Hands together, please, for Dr. Munjid <laughs> Al Mudavis. Thank you, Sama, for your kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you very much again for making the time and effort to attend our 10th anniversary of the Iraqi Cultural Festival. 
uh, put your hands together again for Osama and his great, great warming up of the stage. Now, um, I'm here to um, introduce a gentleman who requires no introductions. So I thought the best way to introduce him is to play a short video. Now, this video is compiled by a non-government organization called Show Me The Way. And I think this video will appropriately depict his story, his life, and what he's about. Can we please play the video? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I um, uh, do um, hip and knee replacement surgeries. I specialize in uh, major reconstructive surgery, but I have a great deal of passion toward um, robotic um, uh, surgery. So I put robots on people who lost their limbs uh, for one reason or another. I came to Australia by boat. I uh, managed to escape from uh, Iraq um, because I refused to brand um, army deserters uh, by taking part of their ease off and um, I managed to escape. I passed through countries uh, uh, such as uh, Jordan, Malaysia and Indonesia um, and I didn't have any other choice but to come by boat to Australia. I didn't have any time uh, to uh, see my family from the moment I um, ran away from the Baghdad University Hospital to the time I got to um, uh, Australia, I didn't manage to contact my family other, uh, other than by phone. What inspired me to become uh, who I am now as um, uh, a surgeon that is interested in robotic surgery uh, was the, uh, the movie The Terminator. Um, that movie that I watched at the age of 12, um, that thriller that a lot of people um, uh, enjoyed the violence in it, I saw a different perspective. Um, um, the ability to um, make half human, half machine, and that what inspired me to become a surgeon. I hope that I helped um, um, many people. Um, my work involves three elements. Number one, my ordinary day-to-day -day work where I uh, do my practice in hip and knee surgery. Um, I help people to um, get their mobility back by um, removing the arthritic joints and replacing that with uh, artificial joints. Uh, my passion is about robotic surgery where I attach robots on people that lost their limbs, arms and legs um, and um, I do a, a lot of work internationally um, through our developing countries um, um, helping with the uh, Red Cross and Amnesty International. Wow, that was definitely a terrific video. And thank you again for showing me the way for putting together this wonderful short story to depict a man who needs no introduction, Dr. Munjid Al Mudaris, which I invite to the stage now. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Does this work? I'm not sure. I can see. Something so I can move around. Thanks very much uh, for this introduction. It is an honor to be presenting in front of you all. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Munjid. I'm, um, I'm a proud Australian. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I'm a squadron leader in the Australian Air Force. And by the way, our Air Force do not throw bombs on people. Um, we usually contribute in peace uh, missions majority of the time. Um, and um, I am a refugee. I came to Australia by boat. So um, I'll talk to you about some of the work uh, that I've been doing and hopefully that will um, um, bring more momentum to uh, um, uh, the, the work that, that we do and, um, and hopefully uh, it will get bigger and bigger, especially that uh, there are many parts of the world that need um, um, uh, help. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello. 
Yeah, that's better. Okay, so um, can we play the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation? Um, so um, I specialize in um, in OC integration uh, surgery, but I'll give you a, a little bit of background from um, uh, my past. If you can flip this slide, this is my father, and that's myself. Um, um, I I grew up in Baghdad and uh, to a, a well-off family, and um, uh, my um, uh, family were uh, basically uh, related to the Iraqi monarch, and um, uh, my my father was the um, head of the Supreme Court, and my uncle was. Uh, 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 a politician and he linked to um, uh, the government and he was Prime Minister for a short period of time before he died. This is Baghdad College and um, a lot of you um, have relatives and uh, or members of family that went to this school. I'm very proud to um, uh, to graduate from uh, uh, Baghdad College and uh, that's during Saddam's time. Uh, unfortunately things have changed in, in that school and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see a brighter future. Next slide please. Um, that's uh, me with uh, one of my bosses um, in Scrub Bay. Uh, so uh, I had the dream of um, making a Terminator at the age of 12. Um, ironically, obviously because of my lack of understanding of English, I didn't um, understand why the Terminator movie was made. The whole idea is not to make Terminators, but uh, obviously I uh, went the wrong way and um, uh, decided that I want to make Terminators. Next slide, please. Um, eventually, due to circumstances in Iraq with the, the brutality, uh, brutality of Saddam's regime, I had to run away and and uh, I ended up uh, on a leaky boat similar to this one, um, bound to uh, Australia. The countries that I passed through, were, none of them were signatories to the Refugee Convention, so I, I couldn't go to a NHCR camp, or, and I didn't have any other choice, unfortunately, because um, I was on the run and it was a very short period of time. Um, um, having said that, uh, it is very uh, well known that a person that's born in a UNCR camp would die most likely an old person before it gets settled. So we have a major international problem with um, refugees, but that's a, a matter for another day. Um, and um, we have now 65.5 million people that are um, displaced, 500,000 of them are in urgent need. Um, I never wanted to leave Iraq. I was comfortable in Iraq. I was uh, not dissimilar to many Syrians that uh, were living comfortably in um, in their country. Um, and um, um, you see now Syria, is half of the population are displaced. I ended up in um, a Curtin Detention Center. Can you flip this slide, please? Um, so this is what it looks like from the boat, uh, basically. And I'm sure, I'm, uh, I mean, I share the experience with many of you who came uh, in a similar way. Next slide, please. Um, and um, when we arrived um, uh, to Curtin Detention Center, unfortunately, um, the government was not uh, prepared back then. So we spent significant time in camps, uh, um, in tents, basically. And we had one tap water, and um, uh, the circumstances were very, very uh, hostile. Next slide, please. Um, I was called 982. That was my name for um, um, the, the period that I spent in the detention center. Next slide slide please and um, um, and um, I was very naughty I couldn't keep my mask shut so um, I made some friends with uh, some of the um, uh, det detention officers and uh, um, basically um, they smuggled a camera for me and um, and we started writing um, um, uh, letters to uh, different international organizations so I was singled out very quickly as a troublemaker and uh, as a result of that I had the pleasure of visiting many w West Australia jails and I'll tell you what the jail system in West Australia is really good <laughs> um, comparatively to the detention center it was like uh, heaven and hell um, so um, and what's what's uh, there are two main features in the jail system in Western Australia number one they treat you like a human being as compared to the detention center and number two uh, you have access to a telephone uh, which which was a lethal weapon in my hand because I managed to contact a lot of organization as a result of that the Department of Immigration put me back in the detention center and they put me in this box it's called the suicide watch box um, and I was kept for 22 hours inside that box for 40 days and um, uh, there was um, 
uh, no sheet, no pillow, there was um, no window, there was a 10 cent piece um, uh, hole in the door and um, uh, I was kept for 22 hours and get um, uh, can go out uh, for two hours with two guards on each side. Um, and every time I ask the question, what am I doing here, they say that we are rehabilitating you, basically. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, so that's a picture of the Terminator that inspired me. Next slide, please. Um, and um, after I was released, and I'm very grateful to be in this country, without being here, I wouldn't be able to achieve what I've done. Um, I managed to um, uh, fulfill my dream by making the Terminator, basically. and. Um, uh, I went overseas to Germany and I studied the technology and uh, brought it back here to Australia and did the first case and then uh, it worked and um, I thought that I will, it will be a hobby and just a dream that came true and then I'll stop but then people, uh, uh, I started noticing that other people needed it and uh, I started doing more and more and then uh, all of a sudden after now we are um, 750 something cases uh, we have done more than the rest of the world combined and uh, we ended up overtaking from the German um, from the Germans and, and we became the world leaders in this technology and uh, um, I just came back um, uh, last week from Walter Reed in uh, um, in Washington DC and um Believe me, I don't like going to America because every, every time I go to America, I get arrested. So, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, and the funny thing is that I walk into the to the um, uh, you know the, the the passport checkpoint, and they say, "What are you doing here?" And it's the same answer always. I'm a keynote speaker and for the Department of Defense or for this organization or for this conference, and they look at me and say, "Yeah, right. Okay, you need to go to this officer," and they send me for uh, for Homeland Security. Um, having said that, sometimes I get the royal treatment where Homeland Security officers wait for me on the plane, uh, basically. Um. And um, it was uh, it was funny. Few um, a few weeks ago, I was uh, um, I was in New York, and um, we finally received this um, um, a, a, an email from um, uh, from an organization called the the Game Changer Organization, which is the um, um, uh, founded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, basically, uh, among you who have visited New York, you know what the Rockefeller uh, Center is, and um, and. Uh, I looked at the email and they said, oh, you won an international award. And I said, yeah, right. So I bent it and threw it in the bin. And then they sent me another email and then a phone call. And they said, well, we send you a few emails and a phone call. And we, 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 you won this, uh, um, this award. We want you to come to New York to receive the award. And I said, OK, and what do you expect me to do? Pay you how much money? And they said, no, 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 no. We'll pay for your flights and your tickets and your accommodation. We just want you to be there. And, um, and I said, are you, are you for real? You're not joking? And they said, oh, we tried to make this the Nobel Prize in America. And, um, and I said, OK. Um, and then they turned up to be real. And I walked into this room, and Bill Clinton was in front of me. <laughs> And um, it was like um, a room filled with people who you've seen on TV, and um, and eventually, I mean, uh, Richard Rockefeller gave me that award, and I was looking at it still in disbelief. Anyway, and um, I was very honoured because um, people who received the award at the same time with me, they were um, the group that. Uh, put down the Fu uh, Fukushima refinery uh, uh, from the earthquake uh, disaster and people who um, um, uh, saved the um, Thai uh, soccer players from the, from the cave, um, as well as Inda Nui, Nui uh, who's the um, CEO of PepsiCo, and she was the person that uh, commissioned um, um, uh, basically diet beverages, which changed the lives of a lot of people. So I'm very honored because of the work that uh, I've done uh, locally and internationally to be recognized for the work. So it does, it, uh, a childhood dream can, can lead to something really um, uh, big deal. Next slide, please. So um, I'm writing the second book. Um, bloody Julia Gillard published her book at the same time as I did. So I was, <laughs> it was the second bestseller. I was in the bestseller. So uh, so hopefully the second one will be in times of I don't even know what's our prime minister's called now and keep changing. I keep track. 
Um, so anyway, uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, amputation for um, a person lead to significant disability and significant body image functionality and quality of life changes. And um, um, amputees, uh, they take more than 50 percent, um, uh, uh, more than 50 percent of them, they take more than a year uh, before they go back to work. And bilateral above knee amputees, they end up in a wheelchair for the rest of their life in most of the time. Next slide, please. Um, so, because of problems with the traditional socket prosthesis, uh, we have um, problems with friction, we have problems with mobility and fit, and we have problems with uh, lack of um, uh, feeling and, and the proprioception because they can't feel the ground. Next slide, please. Um, um, when you have um, uh, basically short stumps, scars, um, uh, flaps, um, uh, neuromas, you end up with uh, more problems for these uh, amputees to wear a traditional socket prosthesis. Next slide, please. Um, over the last six centuries, um, we've been trying very hard. Andreas Barre in uh, 1529, he invented the socket prosthesis and we're still using it um, as um, it was 600 years ago. So the technology that we, we came up with is completely revolutionizing this. Um, next slide, please. With limbs, now we have, next slide, please. Um, and again, um, we have uh, very high-tech uh, robots now. But the problem is with uh, trying to hook them up to the body, there is a serious problem. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, with sockets, we still uh, is a big question mark. Next slide, please. Um, so what I'm talking to you um, um, about today is a revolutionary technology that will eliminate all socket problems, will um, increase the proximal joint range of movement, will um, uh, decrease, um, uh, will resume mobility and restore proprioception and decrease overall pain. And basically it's by inserting um, a robot in directly into the skeleton of the, uh, of the body and restore the mechanics of, uh, um, of uh, mobility for a human being. Next slide, please. Um, uh, so OC integration is basically uh, a connection between uh, macro uh, porous structure of an implant and a bone and the bone grow into it and then you redirect the muscles and the nerves to operate a robotic arm. Next slide please. Um, so um, we have a variety of um, options now that we use um, in um, um, in our inventory to help a lot of people uh, who have um, lost a limb. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, and the whole aim, oops, you went too far. Yep, you can click again. <laughs> um, no, go forward. Yep, so you can see, that's right. Um, um, people really restore their mobility. And that opened a window to expand to um, uh, military combat victims, basically. With um, combats now, um, the, um, uh, the devices that uh, uh, destroy people are becoming very smart. And um, majority of injuries um, are now uh, designed not to kill people, but to maim them and make them disabled. Because if you, uh, if you injure a soldier, um, the, the impact on the community and the impact of the on the country is much higher than if you kill the soldier. So, um, so a lot of these uh, devices now are decided to, to disable people rather than kill them. At the same time, the techniques that we have now in medicine uh, to save people are becoming more advanced. So as a result of that, we are increasing number of casualties dramatically. Because in the past, if you look at um, um, 40 or 50 years ago, majority of people who get injured or lose a limb, they die eventually. So then it's, um, it's an unfortunate loss to the society, but it's a, it's a loss that it's, it's gone with the person that, that dies. But um, nowadays we have a double whammy effect. Number one is that we're having weapons that are disabling people and keeping them alive. And at the same time, our technologies are keeping these people alive. So we will face a bigger and bigger problem uh, with, um, uh, with pat uh, patients that um, are disabled and become um, a burden on the society if the, we cannot rehabilitate them properly and get them back functionally. Next slide, please. 
Um, so uh, this is the Iraqi Prime Minister um, who, I mean, I started doing this in 2008. I went to the um, Iraqi representative um, um, uh, of uh, the Ministry of Health and um, it is very sad, fa very, very sad story. Um, it, was, um, uh, it was a convention in, um, um, in Dubai and, um, and there were delegates from all around the world, uh, basically. And the Iraqi uh, representative um, booth was the only booth that has pictures of their leaders. And uh, uh, it was, I think, Maliki and, and Jalal Talabani. And with all due respect to these two figures, um, I said to the, to the representative, I said, have you noticed something that everybody put their flag on, uh, on their wall except you? You're putting figures. And he said, yeah, we're very proud of our leaders. And I said, well, you're not dissimilar not uh, dissimilar to your previous um, uh, people where they were putting Saddam Hussein's um, uh, picture up there. And anyway, I mean, I can't keep my mouth shut. And um, eventually I said, that's beside the point. I just want to um, um, uh, tell you something. I do this, uh, this kind of work. I'm happy to come to Iraq. Um, I'm happy to pay my bill, my flight. I'll bring a group with me. We want no money from you. Just provide us a hospital that we, we can work in and provide us uh, security. And, and then he said, okay, well, I'll think about it. Uh, why don't you write me a letter of request? And, um, and I'll take that letter to the Minister of Health. And if the Minister of Health accepts your, uh, your, uh, your request, then we may uh, call for you. And I said, well, obviously, you don't get the message. Um, so I turned my back and, and moved away. Having said that, to this guy's credit, they contacted me uh, two years ago. And, um, and they said, well, we need help. We want you to come to Iraq. And uh, that was the first government that um, um, that paid attention to what we're doing. So straight away, I, um, I was flying to Israel, by the way, which is out of all places. And, um, and I said, well, I can, I can come to Baghdad on the way to, uh, to Tel Aviv. And they said, well, let's skip the part of Tel Aviv and <laughs> we'll talk about Baghdad. And I said, well... Do you want me or not? <laughs> and then they said, okay, we'll remove that part from your itinerary. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, we, as a result of that, we managed to get five visits to Iraq, five visits to Iraq so far. And um, um, the majority of these visits were very, very successful. You have to negotiate your... Uh, um, um, with diplomacy, with fights, with with many other aspect um, um, means to to get the work done, and uh, I feel that I'm becoming a politician because there is so much complexity in that country that is really disgusting. But um, hopefully, um, uh, the the goodness inside people will prevail eventually. And and um, and the thing is, you you notice that there is a lot of good people that are trying to um, uh, to make a difference because. Um, um, otherwise, the place will be will be will be a wreck. Next slide, please. Um, so, talking about excess luggage, <laughs> that is excess luggage. As you can see, these are the uh, the, the the gear that we uh, we take with us, and um, I don't take fridges or TVs, but we take a lot of medical equipment, and um, I take my four wives as well, <laughs> and. Um, uh, Funny enough, they don't wear the burqa, so I can tell who who's who. Uh, and um, uh, so w when we when we go there, um, um, actually, they look at these uh, these boxes. They say, what are you carrying in them? And I say, well, a lot of um, uh, stuff, and, um, and but they are not coffins, and they don't have khashikchi or any of these guys. And so it's next slide, please. <laughs> And um, that's Sydney Airport, you can see. And there is a lot of um, um, people that, this is one of my fellows, um, he's from Texas, and he was freaking out because um, he came to do a fellowship with me for, for six weeks, and all of a sudden I'm telling, you, uh, I'm telling him, you're coming with me to Baghdad, and he's wearing this Texan boot, and... Um, uh, and he said, "Going where?" <laughs> and and um, so um, so he came, and um, and um, I get I get few surgeons with me, and few um, um, uh, physicians, and uh, anesthetists, and nurses, and um, uh, and they love it. Next slide, please. 
So when we get to the airport, we uh, um, uh, usually are received with a great deal of, uh, of respect and hospitality. And the first time, this is where Saddam used to receive his dignitaries in, uh, in the airport. And it's funny, uh, we, the first time we landed there, there was, um, I don't know what you call it, a, a shelter uh, just in front of us. And, um, and we were by ourselves. And, uh, and we started looking at each other. And, um, and then all of a sudden, Claudia, my partner, said to me, I think there is someone's foot down there. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I said, she said, I think there is someone sitting there in front of us. And, and he was in the, in the room, one of the security service people. So I grabbed him and said, hi. <laughs> and um, so anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. And uh, people don't, uh, don't understand that if they don't come from that region. Next slide, please. Um, we work mainly in Ibn Sina Hospital, and that's another uh, dilemma because there is a lot of faction. I mean, Iraq is a country that has so many countries inside it, and um, and you have the paramilitary fighting on their own. The Minister of Health is a is a disaster, and the uh, the defense they have a lot of injured people. The police, um, but sadly they all link to the Ministry of Health, which is very corrupt, and um, and everybody is fighting with everybody, and everybody wants us to work in their in their place and we say well we don't give a shit to be honest where we're gonna work just let us work and um, and it can be very frustrating sometimes because they deal with their own internal politics um, having said that the majority try to help uh, as long as they sort out their fighting among themselves next slide please um, and that's us um, wearing the same scrubs that I uh, got from uh, from Sydney and and um, and the, the Department of um, uh, Prime Minister's office they look after us very well they provide us a lot of security and 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 good support next slide please um, and the, then you meet the, the the manager of the hospital and, he, and the first thing he say welcome to my hospital and I, I said oh my god it's not gonna change and I said okay well did your father build this hospital <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, the theatres we had to work on and 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 start um, um, uh, you know improving the situation. It took us um, um, several months to. Um, they stole a, a, a CR machine, like an X-ray machine, from another hospital that was going from Basra to somewhere, and then and then finally they're getting their gear together. The problem is. Um, the Prime Minister uh, uh, um, like allowed, I think, five million dollars and then th uh, three and a half million dollars released to the to the hospital to support um, the work that we do over there. We haven't seen a penny of that yet because it's stuck in the Ministry of Health and we don't know. Um, and so I ended up, we do volunteer work and we bring all the gear with us uh, from Iraq and uh, I ended up putting all these implants in patients and 48 of them, with the exception of the uh, paramilitary, and I have to say it for the record, the paramilitary are the only one who managed to get their patients walking. Um, the rest are still stuck in the Ministry of Health and we don't know when the money ever going to be released. Next slide, please. Um, this is the corridor of the hospital and you can see they do have some uh, good setup. The problem is, is not with the setup. The problem is that Iraq has depleted completely its um, expertise and we need people there they don't need equipment they don't need money they have money they have equipment they don't have talents they don't have expertise next slide please and uh, you can see here we um, uh, we started um, uh, our day the junior doctors the trainees are brilliant uh, they are equivalent to our trainees here in Sydney the senior doctors are disasters next slide please and then you meet um, officials, and that is the most disgusting thing that in, in my part because I really don't like meeting officials. Next slide, please. Um, and um, uh, because we want to just get get going with the work and um, um, and um, away from the politics. Next slide, please. Um, uh, obviously, the media was interested at the beginning, and uh, and then different parties because we were coming toward elections. Each one of them bringing their own media group, and they have their own agenda, and um, and you have to play the politics in that field. Next slide, please. Um, and. Um, uh, this is the staff, the, the team, the nursing staff are really brilliant. And um, poor guys, this hospital, um, 
in the last year, in 2017, the whole year they did 350 cases in one year. 350 cases. In one visit of 17 days, we did 199 cases. And you can imagine the change. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, keep going. These are the staff that we have. We do have some fun sometimes, so we play uh, uh, backgammon and, uh, and chess. Next slide, please. Um, so overall, uh, what we have done, we have done so far in five visits, 384 cases. Um, majority um, of these uh, patients are complex um, uh, cases. We did uh, 109 OC integration cases, and we did 27 joint replacement. Next slide, please. Um, majority of the work is on lower limb because a lot of these injured uh, uh, victims are uh, landmines and IEDs. Next slide, please. Um, and um, we, um, the uh, OSI integration, majority of it is transfemoral amputees. Next slide, please. Um, Keep going. Okay. Um, obviously, because we're treating a lot of soldiers, we treated a few uh, civilians, but majority of the injured uh, people are males. Next slide, please. And um, you can see the distribution here. Um, the work that we did um, mainly is for the paramilitary uh, people. And um, you know, the paramilitary are more um, related to religious factions. And I'm an infidel, I'm not a believer, I don't believe in anything. And uh, they call me, here comes the infidel, he goes the infidel, basically. And every time I, I speak to the head of the paramilitary and I ask him the question, when are you gonna kill me? And he said, your time hasn't come yet. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, this is overall what we've done in, in the world. And you can see Iraq has a big chunk of the number of host integration cases that we've done. But we treated people from all around the world and we don't discriminate. And I was on TV um, in Baghdad and I said, I don't discriminate between a, a Muslim, Christian, or a Jew. And the woman beside me, she said, Jews? We don't say Jews here. I said, yes, we say Jews here. And we had an argument on live TV, basically. Uh, bloody hell. Next slide, please. Um, the good thing is that these young people, they're full of hope, okay, after you treat them. And Iraq has 185,000 amputees. And I get asked the question, you, what you're doing is a drop in the ocean. And I say it doesn't matter because changing one, purple, one person's life will change his family, will change people around him, and these people will change the lives of others. And it will snowball. If we all have the same um, idea and we all work together, um, we can make a difference. And we can have an impact because um, if we give up and, um, and, and, and let go of these people, um, they have no um, future uh, ahead of them. All these people can, um, are unemployed now, um, uh, or were unemployed before we treated them. Um, all of them had no hope. And now a lot of them have returned back to work. Even though the 48 patients from the Ministry of Health that we treated, they still went and, um, and improvised and put, their, put legs and found legs somewhere and, or bought legs for themselves and, and returned back to do something. Um, so despite the incompetency of the Ministry of Health in Baghdad, okay, these people have managed to do something. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see that's their rehabilitation. They sit in the sun, and it's very simple. And amazingly, I don't know if it's uh, if there is a god there that's protecting them or something. They don't get infection. They 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 they're doing very well, and uh, their recovery is extremely fast. I'll go very fast. I'm sorry, I didn't notice. Next slide, please. Um, and these are their wounds. Keep going, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and you can see um, these are the x-rays that uh, uh, these people have. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, that's the physiotherapy department. Next slide, please. And um, um, they, have, they have a program. And they are very motivated. They want to make a difference. Next slide, please. And you can see everybody is interested. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, what makes a huge difference is the smile that you see on these faces. Okay, it, it means the world for us. Next slide, please. Um, and um, um, to be honest, um, I I go in with with the depressive. 
thoughts, but then when I see the smile on these faces and they are motivated, I don't know how on earth these people survive these wars and they keep living and they keep going for the next day. And I think they deserve to be given a chance. Keep going. Next slide, please. Okay. And um, you can see they are no different to anybody else. So, um, um, so they deserve um, an opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, that's a group of them. Keep going, please. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. And press. And ultimately, that's what we want. We want people to be functional, back on their feet, and, and, they, can, um, and they can go back to work and feed their families, basically. I better stop there. questions? Yeah, we do. Hello? Now, if we have time for questions, please ask as hard as it can get. And um, yeah. two questions. <laughs> okay. Well, before we go into questions, I just want to add my two cents in and say thank you very much on behalf of all of us, Iraqi Australians, humans, professionals, doctors, and everyone else around the world for the great work that you do. And it's truly inspiring. And having watched your videos, your interviews with SPS, and seen the numerous surgeries you performed around the world, the, the complete unselfishness and how you put yourself in that situation. I guess for me, you've chosen a career path that helps improve the quality of others. What advice would you give to people who look to pursue a similar path? Yeah, look, I think, I think life is too short. And uh, I'll give you a, a, a personal example, and that's a very personal thing. And, and please um, um, understand what I'm saying very clearly. I was diagnosed with cancer um, 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 three weeks ago, basically. And uh, I had surgery two weeks ago and had one of my balls chopped off. That's why I walk in circles now. <laughs> so, um, and I'm having chemotherapy on Friday and uh, I have to fly to Baghdad. And to be honest, I'm really scared shitless because the last thing you want is to have neutropenia and you have low blood count in, in, in a place like Iraq. But you have to do it because, um, I mean, we need to put our, our interest aside because, um, I don't want to be biblical, but if a man dies, his name will survive out of one of three things. Okay? A charity that he can leave behind, or a knowledge that people can learn from, or children that carry the legacy. And this is, these are very good words. Unfortunately, okay, an unbeliever like me follow these kind of things. And a lot of covered women and, and people wearing turbans and calling them Sayyids and Sheikhs, okay, uh, all what they care about is ripping off their country. So um, life is too short and we live only once, believe me. I've been there. Been to the other side, there's nothing there. Thank you, Dr. Al-Madaris. Um, very eloquently put and so humble. Uh, can I take a question from the audience? Yeah. Dr. Ahmed Rubey. Munjud, we're really proud, proud of you in general and proud of having you today here. Um, I can see two aspects in, in your great work in Iraq. The first aspect related to Iraq, which was obvious, all this help and those people who, and all their relatives will be appreciating your work. But I can see also on the Australian side uh, uh, another benefit or another aspect that you went there as an Australian surgeon. And this, uh, I think, will, will reflect uh, positively on the relationship between Australia 
and, and Iraq for all the other purposes. This is very important. Thing. Now, my question is out of both aspects. You went there and you were in the ground it, in direct and close contact with this narrow circle of uh, politician corrupted people. Do you think after the failure of this sectarian regime, there is a hope in a secular regime replacing it in the near future? Look, I think people are sick of... Um, 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 uh, I'm not a politician, I don't want to be a politician <laughs> ever, but um, um, Iraq have tried secular dictatorship, that didn't work, and then they moved from there to religious parties. And, um, and I think, um, you know, very quickly Iraqis realized that um, uh, following these sectarian uh, parties will not serve anyone any purpose because all what these people care about is their own self-interest. Um, and I think there is, um, what I see inside, um, Maybe I'm seeing the wrong group of people because I meet the more intellectual people. They all sick of the situation, and they all asking. They do, um, th there is one message that we get um, from Iraq is that we don't care whoever comes to to lead this country as long as they are honest and they um, they will uh, invest in the country rather than in their. Um, you know, religious group or um, um, or faction. Unfortunately, human beings naturally are tribal. We all tribal, and um, uh, you know, you go to. Um, uh, to London, some people follow uh, Manchester United, some people follow uh, you know, Liverpool, some people follow other groups. You go to, um, um, uh, you know, here in Sydney, we all follow our um, uh, you know, cricket team and, and things like that. And we have to have a sense of belonging for something. Unfortunately, this has been abused by, uh, um, I would say, the um, um, people who control the masses. Um, because of poverty, because of lack of education, people will um, head toward um, uh, an advice from um, people who know better. And unfortunately, uh, what's happening in Iraq, people who, um, uh, you know, presumably knowing better uh, are the religious heads. And, and that's where we're failing. Um, uh, because there is no honesty, there is no uh, true um, uh, belonging to the flag. Uh, the belonging is all to the tribes um, and to the factions. And that will change uh, eventually because um, people should all wrap around one thing, that's the flag. Um, we all follow the Australian flag uh, here and Iraqis should follow the Iraqi flag um, and um, rather than follow um, their religious um, um, uh, you know, uh, sectors, because nobody wins uh, when religion is involved. I mean, you want to go to heaven, it's great. Go and pray as much as you want between you and God, good for you. Don't imp impose it on others. And that's the message that everybody is telling me. And I hope this will prevail. Thank you. Um, Oh. Look, we're all very excited, very happy to have you here, and unfortunately we're short for time, we'd love to ask as many questions as possible, but just in a closing note, the work that you've been doing all of your life has been nothing short of exemplary, um, especially what you've been doing in Iraq and other places around the world. I guess as a community, Australian, Iraqi, or humans, here, how can we support you to continue doing the work that you're doing? Oh gosh, don't pass these videos to the Iraqi government. <laughs> you're the consulate, where are you? <laughs> okay, which faction do you belong to? <laughs> Oh, well, look, I don't care. I mean, I said that to, to Abadi, I said that to Abu Mahdi Mohandes, I said that to, I even, uh, um, I managed, one thing I'm really proud of is that I grabbed Maliki in the middle of the hospital and I sweep the floor with him. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I'll tell you this story. Um, and and uh, he walked out and um, 
And I said, well, I have these people, I fitted them with, with, um, with legs, we have a problem. I have 48 of them, I need to fit them with legs. And he looked at me and he said, this is not my problem, it's the hospital problem. And I said to him, are you telling me that this is not your problem? They all lost their legs because of people like you. This is definitely my problem. This is your problem. This is all of your problem. Okay? We're all guilty in that. And we all need to think and even spare like half an hour of our time try to do something. If we all collaboratively work on achieving something for these poor people, regardless whether they are Iraq, whether they are Cambodia, whether they are um, Israel, whether they are Palestine, it doesn't matter. We just need to think about other people who are not as privileged and not as advantaged as we are. I think the world will become better and better. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And just before you go back, I would like to invite Dr. Ahmed Arubi to present Dr. Mujahid al Madaris with an appreciation award. Doctor? Can I ask Dr. Bishra to be here? The president of our forum last two years. The previous Ah, uh, who's back? Oh, not him again. <laughs> oh my god. He's still here? These two guys are like, we've fucking had enough. Um, of me, of course. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. What the, the, ca the candor that you speak in, how candidly he comes and how frank, and he says that as it is. And in front of a politician, he says, I don't like politicians. But of course, he means the ones back in Iraq, I'm sure, because <laughs> there's a lot of poetry in what you said. There's po poetry in your politics, uh, Councillor. And, and, and it's so motivational, so inspirational. Uh, I, you know, some of you who've seen the film or read my book, you'd know that I was going to, I was pushed to be a doctor, become a doctor, but uh, I didn't get enough marks and, and uh, you know, my dad always said, you know, doctors heal the body, storytellers heal the soul, and we've all, I think we've all got a, a hand in this, you know, the politicians, their job is, is to uh, nurture whoever's coming up the ranks and, and, and identify those people and, and give us money and grants and and all that sort of stuff um, and uh, so we can, because the power of story as you can see when doctor was up here telling us a story and and the thing is again back to the humble thing so it glossed over being 40 spending 40 days inside a container and uh, you know these uh, <laughs> traumatic events and to come out on the other side and free balling as you were doing you know and moving around and but still telling such a poignant such a heartfelt story with such an amazing message uh, I I, um, we must put our hands together again for the wonderful work because uh, you know coll collectively only can we you know we, we have a saying you know drop by drop makes the ocean and and yes you know we're all part of this drop but together uh, we can drown uh, the systems in fact um, you know he, uh, Dr. Munjid, you, you were complaining that your book was up against Julia Gillard's walking free now my book was up against yours <laughs> so uh, you know I got the New South Wales Premier's literary prize and I still couldn't compete with walking free but um, you know I, I, we have similar stories that you know we we came uh, as refugees and, um, and and you know with very little English I don't know how how much English you, you probably you know being a doctor you your English would have been <laughs> the level of English I had was we rocked up to the airport this is age 13 you know in the late 90s and I come in and I finally could read the alphabet and I tell my dad I was so excited I'm telling saying dad dad look I can read a, a sign there it's, it's taxi and I could just put the alphabet together taxi at the airport and my dad says where I said there it says taxi he looks at me he looks at the sign and says that says exit you're reading right to left <laughs> You're reading right to left like an Arab! 
But, I, uh, but when I came here, and we're going to uh, wrap up because we've got a big day ahead of us, and you can go downstairs and have your fun. But I came here, and my mum said, uh, my mum said, you know, talk up the doctor as much as you can, you know, because one day, you know, they could someone the way you're going will cut your neck off. I'm like, that's not how orthopedic works, mum, you know. But she said, uh, t tell everyone that we are happy that we stopped the boats. I'm like, what? <laughs> Mom? She's like, yes, you go and you tell everybody that we are happy that we stopped the boat. I'm like, what? How can we? We are refugees ourselves. How can we be happy? She's like, tell them, you son of a shit. <laughs> Ibn al <-Khara. laughs> I'm like, Mom, you realize when you call me son of a shit, <laughs> Ibn al <-Khara, laughs> you Anyway, uh, and she said, she said, tell them, tell them we are happy that we stopped a boat. I'm like, what? First of all, it's not stop a boat. It's a plural. It's stopped the boat. She's like, no, 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 not stop the boat. We like stopped a boat, stopped a boat, stopped Tony a boat. <laughs> So we've got to keep our politicians honest. Now, speaking of a politician, there's an appreciation award for our councillor that uh, we'd like to, we, we have to give the appreciation award. Uh, people are hungry, we hear. So the, the, we'll just get the councillor up here, please. Where's the award? Let's give him the award. A round of applause. That's his award. And one for the mayor as well, uh, Mayor Wendy Weller. Councillor Nathan. Yes, Councillor. Thank you very much. As I said, it's so vital that this uh, collaboration continues. And one for the mayor as well. Here we go. Yes, we're all hungry, but we're going to get there. It's not Ramadan. You see, in, in, in Ramadan, th those of you who fast, this guy's a non-believer. He doesn't believe in God, but we have to believe in God and we have to fast. Yes, photos, photos. And, uh, and, and what we have to do when we fast, you know how you can break your fast, how you don't have to fast? Who knows the hile, the secret? I'll tell it to you. So first, if you're pregnant, you don't have to fast. Can't happen to me. If you're the elderly and, and sick, oh, fuck, I can't pretend to be too old or too sick, so I can't do that. But if you travel, yeah. then you can break your fast. What constitutes travel in Islam? 23 kilometers from the last line of light, last li light of town. 23 kilometers. So what we do every morning, get in the car. It has to happen before sunrise, otherwise it's not a travel. The day's begun, you have to fast. We sit in the car, put the odometer on zero, from the, on the Hume Highway, and we drive, we drive out. What's way out to Sydney? There's the Wallen, Li Liverpool. <laughs> you drive back to Liverpool, okay, and you drive, but it has to be outside the city. So you're driving 23 kilometers, and then you can break your fast, you can eat. What we used to do every morning, get in the car, it's cold, 4 a.m., and then 23 kilometers outside, there's a little rest stop, and there's 12 other Iraqis already there. <laughs> So just to end this, uh, you know, we, we've had a bit of fun, we've had some nice serious stuff and, and wonderful things. Uh, my favourite, the shortest poem ever written is by the great Muhammad Ali, who uh, I love what he stood for and uh, it goes, me, we. So I'll leave you with that and that is it for us for, for the night, for the afternoon and downstairs, get ready for the coffee and the tea. <laughs>